Good afternoon and welcome to another episode of A Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. Today I have with me in the studio uh, uh, Michelle Swingel Regala and Kirsten Carlson, uh, both science illustrators. And this is going to be a little, a little bit different show than we usually do. I usually have practicing scientists on and we spend a lot of time having to get them to explain in relatively clear, simple terms some of the intricacies of their science. You guys are both artists. People understand what artists do in some sense. Science illustrators maybe a bit less so. But uh, so we're gonna but we're gonna talk about that intersection and the overlap of science, art, communication, naturalists, and all that kind of good stuff. So maybe uh, maybe start out. You, you both have oddly sort of parallel backgrounds, right? You you went to the same science illustration program a year or two years apart or something, and you also both ended up doing the same. A naturalist sort of cruise, or, or being uh, illustrate. Uh, tell, tell me about this this cruise thing. <laughs> sure. Um, Kristen and I both went through the science illustration, science communication program at University of California Santa Cruz right. in the '90s. We can speak um, about how we independently arrived at that sort of graduate program, but we didn't move here until different times, and it was only about a year ago that we finally met each other. Uh -huh. And I'm so glad that we found each other. It seems like in other cities where we've lived, there has usually been a, a nexus of science illustrators uh -huh. that we connect with. But here in Hawaii, I didn't meet that group of people f for many years. So it was frustrating to not have that sort of community. But now that Kirsten is here, we're finding other people coming uh -huh. out of the woodwork. So uh -huh. it, we have a good group here. Oh, I'll have to maybe introduce you to one of my colleagues who runs a program called Picturing Science for our, for mm -hmm. our group. And, uh, Gets, helps kids learn science through doing doing art. Oh, know? fantastic! Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So it's inter interesting stuff. So maybe start out with a, a simple sort of question. But what what is a scientific illustrator or a science illustrator? A science illustrator is someone who creates illustrations in service of science, mm -hmm. and it typically is an illustration that tries to convey a scientific idea mm -hmm. or a concept or an organism. So when you, for example, see a bird book, and it has drawings in it. Those were done by a science illustrator. Okay. And sometimes in the role of more of an educator, a science illustrator can take on the, the role of an interpreter. So I worked at Monterey Bay Aquarium where I did illustrations that helped interpret organisms to the public. Uh -huh. Okay. So that is, you can, you can through uh, as is being seen here on the, sh on the screen, you can emphasize certain aspects of things in a way that maybe a, a photograph couldn't. You can strengthen, you can call attention to particular features in, in good ways so, uh, so that a, a accompanying text can discuss them and the reader will be drawn to that particular piece or facet of the work, right? Correct. Okay, yeah. okay. And there's a, there is very much then, there's a, a communication and an illustration, uh, an education aspect to this. And you've spoken of connecting with uh, with children, being this being a science illustration, being a great way to help draw kids into science, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's it's uh, very uh, very visual. It keeps the language barriers down. Uh, we I do a lot of work out in Asia, so we have mm -hmm. kids who don't speak English very well. But you know, this picturing science program my colleague does, for instance, overcomes that very neatly. You know, because. Mm -hmm. One of the things about Michelle's work with fiber that I really like is it engages people who normally would look at an artist and think, oh, they can draw. Mm -hmm. And when you're actually, I mean, what's the experiences you have had when people have said, what it, how do I knit that? Mm -hmm. Right, I think that after I was a, a more technical science illustrator and I shifted into the medium of fiber, mm -hmm. I found a connection to an audience that was familiar with things that were knitted or crocheted. And, uh -huh. and they could see how I approached this, and yet they might not have necessarily thought about creating something that represents science mm -hmm. in the work that they do. So I like being able to bridge that gap between people making functional pieces versus making representational pieces that, that tell a story about science. Right, you don't, you don't tend to think of, of yarn as being something that you create representational mm -hmm. il illustrations, as it were, and yet this is, this is very evocative, certainly. Uh, uh, I mean, does it represent a particular species of... There, let's see, okay, now you put me on the spot. <laughs> I can't remember exactly what species I was considering when I was making this, but, but this is an example of a project that I coordinated in 2010, mm -hmm. where I invited people from anywhere in the world to look at Hawaii marine science, marine uh -huh. species around our archipelago, and then take from that list or from those images um, inspiration, be it a color pattern or 
an actual form, and then this is meant to represent something like a nudibranch with the with oh. the the mantle that does those ruffles, or maybe a a, a coral head. Okay. And and so this may not represent an, an exact species, but mm -hmm. it certainly gives the feeling of something you might see underwater. Right. So right. that's what we created with this with this larger exhibit. Right. So this was all part of this. Was this part of this hyperbolic coral reef? Project. That's right. Yeah, I saw a little blurb <laughs> as you referred to it. It looked like quite an amazing, an amazing thing that mm -hmm. had people from from around around the world. And you also do other uh, large scale, uh, again, weaving in a very different sort of way, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Nowadays, I've I've taken this this science idea and gone on a tangent. I've started to work in three dimensional forms mm -hmm. rather than just on paper. And it was a surprise. It's not something that I would have imagined myself doing 15 years ago. I thought I would have been a science illustrator for all my life, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm really thankful to have had this opportunity to explore these other modes of working. Right, so some, some of it really, you actually are doing representations of scientific data. Right. And, uh, and so just as, as that uh, two shots back, the, the cone thing that was there is actually water flow uh, it's an interesting story. I was seeking. Yeah. I was seeking an outlet to be able to create more abstract artwork, uh -huh. and yet I'm so steeped in science and information and form that I didn't necessarily have a jumping-off point to work in a more abstract manner mm -hmm. without feeling disingenuous. Mm -hmm. And so, luckily, this residency program that Kristen and I have both been on gave me the outlet to do that kind of work. Um, the Schmidt Ocean Institute is mm -hmm. an organization that supports scientific research. They have a 277-foot research vessel that travels primarily around the Pacific, and it invites scientists to apply for ship time to go from point to point and to conduct research along that transit. And they've been doing that for five years. Now, in the past year, they've invited artists to come on board to be embedded within the science crew and mm -hmm. then interpret the research that's going on on board. Mm -hmm. And while Kristen and I... I think had inclinations to both want to do this as a science illustrator in, in, the, in the, the chain of how many illustrators and artists have gone on voyages around the world in mm -hmm. history. You know, that was so exciting for us both. I decided to take the different tack and I decided to apply as a fiber artist. Mm -hmm. So while I was on board, I made these textiles. The, it, it looks like a, a knitted square, but on top of that square, I've added some data points. And those huh. neon colored lines are the, it, this is a graph that shows different qualities of the water at one of each of the stations where we stopped along our voyage from Honolulu to Tahiti. Um, the data are either oxygen content, temperature, or light levels, mm -hmm. which are um, uh, a proxy for different types of plankton in the water. Sure, sure. So, so this is very different from working on organismal information, mm -hmm. which is more typical for the types of things we do. But in this case, at least I had a way to talk about the science that was being done on board. So I think it was, in fact, a really good match on the mm -hmm. part of Schmidt Ocean to ask me to do this. And then those wire sculptures, the larger pieces, are essentially, if you take that graph, and then you look at the y-axis, and then you wrap that graph around the y-axis, that's what I've sculpted mm -hmm. in those knitted wire rows. Right. So it's another way to make a, a form, a volume, showing right. information. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, mm -hmm. it, it's, uh, it's fascinating stuff. It, and it's, a, it's a great way, that, again, to show that intersection between art and science in, in a very functional way. Yeah, and that's, that's so important. People don't, they often think of these things as being very separate worlds, art, art world and science world, but they're really very deeply meshed. Uh, my, my wife is a, is a kaleidoscopist. And so the kaleidoscopes, while considered an art form, of course, are very heavily based in science and mm -hmm, reflectivity and mm -hmm. precise angles and da 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 da. So yeah, I, I understand that. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of those points that you just mentioned about your wife's interests are also things that Kirsten was looking at on uh -huh. her voyage. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that a little bit? <laughs> um, no, <laughs> not to want any segues for you, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, actually, I got stuck on what you said your wife does. So she makes kaleidoscopes? Is that uh, what she, I'm understanding? Yeah, right, right. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so to bring it back to what I did, so the when I was on the Schmidt Ocean Institute voyage, that was just a couple months ago, January, mm -hmm. the end of January to the end of February. Mm -hmm. And I was on board with NASA scientists and a bunch of great researchers from educational institutions around mm -hmm. the U.S. and internationally. Mm -hmm. And I was charged with being the creative one on board while they tried to take ground truthing samples of plankton mm -hmm. to coordinate with the satellite imagery that NASA currently takes of the oceans to sure. look at phytoplankton biomass sure. and other important things relating right. to the to our cycles in the ocean. Right. 
So what was fun for me, and I brought the plankton poster with as one of the images, mm -hmm. uh, as a result of that journey, I created the plankton during the, I illustrated plankton during the cruise and mm -hmm. then formed it into a poster. Mm -hmm. And I did that all on a rocking and rolling ship because <laughs> that was one of the parameters of being an artist at sea. Uh -huh. And I was on seasick medicine the entire time, but it was a fantastic voyage and in oh, 21 it. days, yeah, that's yeah. it. So. I just want to speak to this really quickly. So plankton are something that are invisible to our eye. Not right. many people even know what plankton are when you say the word. So plankton are made up of lots of different tiny organisms that are both plant and animal-like. Right. But there's no, nothing really comparable to it in what we look at when we say plants and animals. Mm -hmm. So what you're looking at are all organisms that are smaller in diameter, uh, smaller than the diameter of your human hair. Mm -hmm. So take a cross section of your hum human hair. And what I was fascinated by is the diversity of shapes and sizes. And these are all phytoplankton. So these are all organisms that actually use sunlight to make their food. Mm -hmm. And that was the kicker for me because as a scientific illustrator, I've loved plankton for a long time because I've been ocean focused, mm -hmm. but I'd never really got to see these many plankton for this long, this up close, across the entire Pacific. We went from Honolulu to Portland, Oregon. Mm -hmm. okay. And yeah, this was a poster. And so I'm thrilled with it because I'm hoping a person, when I create something in this perspective, I'm hoping a person is either interested in it and dives a little deeper and learns a little bit more or says it's not for me and continues on their day. <laughs> but my goal is to create something that's visually interesting. Sure, you want to engage people. That's the first, exactly. that's the first step in learning, right? <laughs> and and the, the beauty of it is phytoplankton clearly is tremendously important, right? One of my uh, guests from past show pointed out he had a little routine and sort of said, take two breaths. If, if it weren't for the phytoplankton, you couldn't do one of those, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. uh, they're producing half the oxygen on Earth or something on that order, as I, as I understand it. So it's really, uh, they're, they're critically important and, and you know, should be more widely appreciated and understood in the effects of what we do to the ocean, including making it warmer, making it more acidic, and dumping tons and tons and tons of plastic goop into it. Mm -hmm. We should understand what that's going to do to the plankton, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's great. That's a great way to, to draw attention uh, to, to a critical, you know, critical social issue of our time. Yeah. Yeah, wonderful. Indeed. And uh, you've also done things with, for kids, the, like uh, this Ocean Seasons book? Yeah, so I'll just speak to this part of my life right now. So I fairly recently got into children's book illustration, uh, fairly recently, as in the, it's been 10 years or so. And uh, it's another communication medium mm -hmm. to another audience. So for me, a picture book is 32 pages with which I can connect kids and their parents, because parents are actually the ones usually reading picture books to their children, with nature. In, in my particular case, it's ocean. So the three books that you guys are sharing with people today uh, out in the audience are an activity book called Where the Land and Sea Meet that has a little bit about marine organisms you find in the intertidal zone all mm -hmm. around the world. So no matter where you are on the planet, you might be able to relate to something you see. Mm -hmm. Even if you're landlocked, mm -hmm. you can learn to draw a crab. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the earlier one that uh, maybe can come back up is Ocean Seasons, and that was a book that was introducing the concept of spring, summer, autumn, and fall, uh, sorry, autumn and winter mm -hmm. happening underwater in a different way, but similar to what happens above water. Right, because animals, marine life migrates, similar to how birds and mammals all migrate, right? And they, they do this seasonally, and, and except there are vertical components to migration too, right? This is true, uh, yeah. yeah. They migrate up and down as well as north and south. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then Sea Secrets was a really cool nonfiction book that I worked with the National Science Foundation on. There are scientists all over the world doing long-term ecological research that are studying things over the long term, as the name shows. So when I was brought in as, an as part of the education outreach for the Antarctic program in Palmer Station and for the California Current program, I, created, I helped create the illustrations, I did create the illustrations for Sea Secrets. And what was really great about that book is it used plankton again in this oh. form krill to tie in two really different ecosystems, California and Antarctica, cool. together. Because they both are the bottom of the krill provide food for all the organisms in both those locations. Right. And we're going to go into this further, but right now we're going to have to take a quick break. Uh, you're here with us on Likeable Science, and I'm glad you've joined us. And I'm here with uh, Michelle schwengel Regala and Kirsten Carlson. And we'll be right back after a short break. 
Hi everyone, Ted Rolson here, host of our Think Tech show, Where the Drone Leads. And a lot of you, of course, have been setting your clocks at uh, uh, 4 o'clock on Friday so that you can make sure you see our show. It's now changed. It's now going to be at noon on Thursdays. Noon on Thursdays, new standard time for Where the Drone Leads. And Where the Drone Leads is to systems like this, capabilities that we're using here in Hawaii these days. And we need you to pay attention to this be part of it. So see you at noon on Thursdays. Thanks for watching ThinkTech Hawaii and look forward to seeing you at Education Matters on Tuesdays with me, Carol Mon Lee. Hey, Stan the Energy Man here. Thanks for joining us on ThinkTech Hawaii and I invite you to join me every Friday on ThinkTech Hawaii at 12 o'clock where I give you all the energy news that's worth talking about here in Honolulu. And uh, I love to talk about hydrogen. So join us on Friday on my lunch hour here at ThinkTech Hawaii. Be there. Aloha. Hi, you're back here with us on Likeable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen, uh, and I'm here in the Think Tech studios with Michelle Schwingel Regala and Kirsten Carlson, uh, science illustrators. And we're talking about how they got into their science illustration careers, what they've done with their science illustration careers, and some of the, the, the power and value of being a science illustrator, the education, communication aspects of it. So, why don't could either of you tell me a little more about? sort of some of the challenges. I mean, you, you mentioned the challenges of doing it on a rocking boat, but uh, do you have challenges with the people who want you to do particular illustrations and then, then don't like them, or? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, there are lots of obstacles that have come up. Um, in large part, there's simply a matter of have, having jobs to support the work that we are, are trained to do. Mm -hmm. It seems like a lot of places don't always write in the, uh, when you're writing a grant, for example, mm -hmm. you may not apply for monies that would cover the illustrations that you need to, to um, accompany your research. Mm -hmm. So that's something as museums, universities are losing funding right. as time goes by. It seems like sort of those um, peripheral staff members, <laughs> as illustrators often are considered, mm -hmm. are among the first to go. So oh. that's, that's a challenge okay. on a greater scale. Um, can you think of something about doing the particular work? A lot of people think that photography should be able to replace science <laughs> illustration. Why right. do we need modern people right. in a time of photography or, right. or camera work? But, right. but certainly, you know, someone needs to operate this, but you also need to know what to look for exactly. and how to highlight the, sp the salient features of whatever organism you're talking about. Yeah, I'll, I'll, um, I want to say something about photography versus illustration mm -hmm. and also about the challenges and the benefits of both. So mm -hmm. photography is an excellent medium. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt about it. Right. But the one thing you have to remember is above all else a picture does tell a, th a, a picture is worth a thousand words but on the same hand when you take a photograph and uh, it's representing one image, one organism, one frozen moment in time which mm -hmm. can be fantastic if you're trying to catch the sunset mm -hmm. but if you're trying to do an illustration of a uh, sea turtle or coral or something that requires you to take all the characteristics of that organism and, mute and meld them into one thing, that's where illustration is really beneficial. So the challenge of that is oftentimes when you're charted with doing a scientific illustration, you try to have a scientist waiting in the wings to make sure you, it, they review your work because a scientist has a keen eye when it comes to observing what's right and wrong in an animal or a, right. any kind of scientific illustration, sure. whether it be a process illustration or some of the ones that you guys have been right. showing about what we've, we've done. So yeah, so that can be a real challenge because you'll be working on a piece of art and you might get the call that says, uh, you didn't really get the bill right on this right. critter, so mm -hmm. please redo it. Right. or. Yeah, that can be yeah. a challenge. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And the, there is that whole issue of sort of capturing the essence of, of, a, of a thing. This is at least what my, my artist colleague talks about. And it's not so much getting every detail right, but it's getting a, a shark to look like a shark. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. <laughs> getting the sharkiness of it, as it were, right? Yeah, I have <laughs> an interesting side story about that. So again, photography for taking a picture of a full-grown great white has its challenges, as mm -hmm. we all would know. So the fun thing about that illustration is it was blown up to adult great white size, which is about 20 feet long. Mm -hmm. And that was so people could get a sense of scale. The pectoral fin alone is three and a half feet tall. 
But the thing is, is that when they had me draw it or paint it, they said, could you please make the mouth a little more closed than normal? Because a normal great white shark, the mouth would be open. You could see the pearly whites. Because we wanted to look a little less threatening mm -hmm. when the head of the audience <laughs> is next to it. So that was a fun thing that I could do because I was an illustrator. So that's a little side story about that one. Well, that's, that's great, yeah. <laughs> yeah you, can, you, can, you can adjust as needed. Yes. I think one of the most challenging tasks that I was ever assigned was to draw a, a species of thrips and they look like little clear plastic bags <laughs> and and trying to find the delineation between abdominal segments thoracic segments it was it was so challenging I mean I've illustrated genitalia where mm -hmm. it also looks like a plastic bag but there might be some section that's more sclerotized you know the the chitin that mm -hmm. creates structure in insect right. exoskeletons but yeah working on plastic bag illustration, <laughs> it's much harder than drawing a brown paper bag, as is often the case in art school. <laughs> and I, can I just add something to that? Sure, okay, sure. so so one thing we're alluding to is we also illustrate for different audiences, right. but, but we also have different clients. So for the scientist, having the specifications of a particular thing on the structure of the body is really important, mm -hmm. whereas like if you're doing for an educational public institution, the position of the mouth might not be so important as the overall emotional response right. for it. So that's something we get to play around with a lot, which is really subjective sometimes, mm -hmm. and it's not always what you see. It's not always drawing what you right, see. Right. Mm -hmm. So speaking of audiences, uh, can, can people see your work locally? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Where? At the Hub, which is the okay. former Sports Authority at Ward Center. Um, the Honolulu Biennial is going on right now, uh -huh. and I was invited to be a participant in that, one of the local Hawaii artists, and some of my wire sculptures and my knitted um, data sets are on view there. Um, the ones that we saw the on ones screen. That we saw there, that's right. <laughs> excellent, excellent. I also just had some crocheted octopodes, some cephalopods on display in Crete, a little further away, uh -huh. but uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> it, that was an exhibit that had been here at the Commons Gallery and now is, is traveling, wow. so it's exciting to also have an audience Elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, we will, both of us have exhibits and things coming up off and on. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty active online, so mm -hmm. you can always check out my information to see what's going on. And then we both have our artwork traveling as part of the Schmidt Ocean Institute uh -huh. booth that's going around um, to different, I don't know where they are right now, they're, she's go they're going around to different events, and I'm sorry I don't have that information, but if you look at the Schmidt Ocean Institute's website, they may have that information. Uh -huh. So both our artwork, it, when it comes That's back right. around to Hawaii, it might be available for the public. It was at Mark's Garage. Oh, excellent, excellent. Yeah. That's super. That's there was just an exhibit in San Francisco. There's another one coming up in Bermuda, and also part of a sailing event. And then I believe it'll come back to the Bishop Museum in the fall here, so stay tuned for that. Wow, wow. Oh, that's, that's very exciting then to have your work traveling so broadly. You know, mm -hmm. that, uh, mm -hmm. That's very, very impressive. You get, you get a good audience. And uh, again, it speaks to the, uh, by not having to tie the language to printed words, you're, you're getting a message to a, a potentially much broader audience, right? It's not mm -hmm. limited to English speakers only or whatever, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. At present, I'm, I'm in, I'm, filling the role of someone like an artist in residence, mm -hmm. but not necessarily under that title, at the Bishop Museum. Uh -huh. um, during the Journeys exhibit, the previous exhibit they had at Hawaiian Hall, I was invited to bring some of these pieces to be included in the exhibit, and then I was also on display within the exhibit on Tuesdays <laughs> where I would do some work in view, and then I would talk with the public about what I was working on and talk about the intersection of art and science, and also reveal some of the specimens from their behind the scenes collections. Uh -huh. So I'm still doing that on Tuesdays at the Bishop Museum. Okay. And then Kristen is also an artist in residence locally. I am. I'm a little more behind the scenes, though. <laughs> I'm, I go out to Coconut Island once oh. a week as an artist in residence at a place called the Maker Lab there. Okay. And I'm working on a couple educational outreach products with Dr. Judy Lemus, who's sure. out there. Sure. Judy. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's very important for people, just as it's important for people, and that's what I do on this show a lot, is, is sort of introduce scientists to the public, and most members of the public don't know scientists at all. I mean, literally, surveys show if you ask people to name a scientist they know, people don't, you know, are completely blank, the vast majority of people. So it's important also with artists, I suspect, and particularly, I think, when we get into this interesting intersection of art and science. Uh, very good to have people who are willing to, to sort of play that role of stepping out and sort of saying, this is what I do, this is how I do it, and, and inviting, that, inviting the public on in at that level. But I know there's great work going on out at uh, on uh, the island out there. Um, I have a good, good friend, uh, 
Mary Hagedorn, you probably run into her. Does you might make, illustrate her coral sperm or eggs? I don't know. <laughs> Love to. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, yeah, again, the uh, it's it, it's it, it's wonderful stuff. It, it's so how can I put it? it? It's so critical to do this to 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 be able to focus people's attention and, and engage them. And sometimes, yes, when you've got something that's virtually invisible, like your plastic bag uh, frips, you were calling mm -hmm, them, mm -hmm. right? You know, to be able to to make that engaging, visually interesting, so that people will stop and say, "Hey, what is this one?" Well, you know, or present an interesting shape that people say, huh, ah, is that a nudibranch or a coral head, you know? Mm -hmm. So, and same with children's books, of course, that's, the, that's one of the first introductions, how you get kids engaged is, is through, you know, pretty, sort of pretty pictures, you know, that, that are colorful, action-filled, you know, really suggest the whole story to them, right? Yeah. Uh, so that, that's vital. Um, and let me ask you this, moving forward, where, where do you, you both had these sort of odd careers in the sense of they've, they've moved around or doing different things, where, where, where do you see yourself? You're only going to get odder. <laughs> where do you see yourselves in, in you know, five years? Well, in, in five months. <laughs> uh, yeah, in five years, um, my dream is to be making income. My husband's retiring soon from the military. And I would like to be bringing in a majority of the income through my skills as a science communicator. Mm -hmm. And I would like to keep exploring nature and connecting different audiences to nature. Okay. Mm -hmm. you. I've lived here 11 years. Mm -hmm. And during this time, I thought I would have illustrated a whole lot more endemic species. <laughs> so I know I have a long list to still mm -hmm. get to. I. I, am, I was reluctant to move here 11 years ago, but now that I'm here, I realized quickly that this is a fantastic place for me, for my family, and I feel like there is so much that can be revealed through, through the communication of science and art. So I think this is a great place to keep working. Super, super. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Kirsten. Thank you, Michelle. It's been a real pleasure having you here on Likeable Science. You, you've broadened the dimensions of the, of the show, and I appreciate it very much. So well, aloha you. to you both. And I hope that uh, you'll join us next week for another episode of Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii.